Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Paul Flanagan, Professor Paul Flanagan, and I'm part of the MLS program and the JD program at the Thomas R. Klein School of Law. I'm really excited uh, to help present tonight the VCO Career Panels and Series. Uh, tonight's panel, VCO panel event, will be uh, uh, on careers and healthcare compliance, which is really one of my favorite topics in the world. Um, I myself teach here online, um, and I have taught live classes on compliance, including uh, compliance skills and a compliance capstone course and a healthcare course as well. Um, I'm also the director of the Privacy, Cybersecurity, and Compliance Program at Drexel Klein School of Law. Um, I'm really excited and honored to have all the panelists here with me tonight um, and to have this conversation really for the students and for anybody else that wants to learn more about healthcare compliance and careers in healthcare compliance and privacy um, as well. Um, and I just am really happy that you've all agreed to be here. This is a really an amazing panel, all coming from differing backgrounds and ways uh, that they've gotten into this job. And I think they're gonna really enlighten you tonight. Uh, but before we kick off our panelists, I'd like to introduce everyone um, to Laura Jacobus, a, a fellow professor here at Drexel, and she will give you some insight into the VCO program. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, looks like we have a couple slides here, and Laurel is also with us tonight, so we'll both just jump in here. Um, uh, why don't I introduce myself? So I'm an attorney, uh, and I at Drexel teach compliance and, and also a risk management course and a compliance communications course. Um, and my background is running compliance in a, in a high tech company and, and being in uh, high tech for about 30 years, which I guess uh, says something about how old I am. Uh, <laughs> Laurel, do you want to introdu introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Laurel. I'm an attorney um, as well. And I partner with Laura and Paul on the, v the VCO, the virtual career office. Uh, for my day job, I'm a transactional attorney and also do a lot of corporate compliance. But for in this capacity, I'm here to advise students and to assist them through the modules in, in the career office, which is, it's a lot of fun. And I look forward to, to telling you more about it. Laura will continue. Okay, so what is the VCO? Um, this is actually kind of a mini course that Laurel and I um, and Paul built about a year and a half ago. Uh, it has seven different modules. It's actually free to students and alums at Drexel. And it actually contains very distinct modules on different topics um, like uh, you know, interviewing, networking, career planning documents, et cetera. Um, we also offer short exercises along with videos and career resources. So part of the part of those courses, part of the or part of the course in the modules is, um, is static and part is dynamic because we continue to add uh, current job listings in that we think would be appropriate for all of the different uh, Drexel areas of focus. Um, we also offer live Zoom sessions, uh, not this panel discussion, which is fabulous, and we thank you all for doing this tonight, but Laurel and I also run some separate Zoom sessions on these topics with students, and then we post uh, the Zoom sessions in the VCO um, as well. And then at the end of a student going through the seven different modules, which they can do at their own pace, we actually mentor them. So they can choose one of us to work with uh, and we work with them directly. And I know Laurel and I have both absolutely loved working with students directly and helping them figure out their, you know, their compliance or, or cybersecurity or other passion and actually help them to, uh, to ultimately find roles. We welcome you to, to participate in it. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, there's the kinds of exercises that are in there are things like, you know, um, elevator speech, how to prepare for an interview. Um, the idea is really to, to meet students where they are in, in their job, either in, like currently in their career, trying to advance their career. Um, presumably folks do the degree program here at Drexel because they're interested in either furthering their career, shifting in their career, et cetera. So we really try to focus on as well as use of technology. So um, digital networking, use of LinkedIn and other tools, which not everyone considers necessarily when they're in a degree program, but it's great to be able to think about those things and uh, kind of get prepared for the job that you want while you're still in the program, as opposed to waiting until you get out. So that's what we focus on and we, um, 
yeah, we'd love to have a lot of people drop by and visit us so we, that we can work with them. Thank, thank you, you, Laura. And thank you, Laurel, for joining us. Laura was on the last uh, event as well. So thank you, Laurel, for the two of you have really done an amazing job. This is, I think, what distinguishes our program from any other program out there, this VCO. And that's one of the reasons we really wanted to highlight uh, this and put, put these types of events on. So we're very, very lucky to have the two of them. Um, so I'm gonna launch right into with the panelists. Um, the VCO is the reason we're all sitting here today and we have an excellent group of panelists who will talk about what it's like to work in the healthcare compliance space. And we brought together an excellent group of panelists to represent many different areas and work in the healthcare compliance space. What I'm gonna do, because we have a, such a great group and a large group is that I'm gonna do is ask each panelist to introduce themselves. And then after they've introduced themselves to then give an answer to the general question, what is a typical day in your work life? Start off, I, um, one of the panelists is an alumni of the program here at Drexel. So I'm gonna kick off straight with you, Tracy, if that's okay. And then after you, I will, I will launch into Kim and Bob as compliance officers, and, and then we'll take it from there. I am um, the, as Paul said, an alum of the program. I am the Assistant Vice President of US Graduate Medical Education at ECFMG Famer. We are an organization that works with physicians around the world to um, ensure that, that physicians who are coming here are qualified and, and competent. Um, I, I work um, primarily to ensure that our organization is compliant with Department of State regulations um, with regard to the J-1 program and with respect to um, work with the Department of Treasury with respect to OFAC compliance. So it's been really exciting. I've, I've spoken to Paul um, a lot over the past year about building a compliance program. We've, our organization has not um, had a robust compliance program and we are moving towards that. So it's been, it's been really fulfilling to, to work with everyone at Drexel to establish that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Upshaw. I am the Vice President and Chief Compliance, Privacy, and Internal Audit Officer here at Drexel. Um, I've been with Drexel for a little over a year now. And um, prior to that, I was with a, uh, a healthcare company. And prior to that, J&J, &J, and I've been a consultant. And so I've seen compliance and privacy specifically um, from a lot of different perspectives. The, the, the great thing about Drexel is that um, I am still very much a consultant <laughs> um, as a compliance and, and, and privacy officer um, in particular. Uh, but I also, the, the, the one thing that I didn't like as much about or kind of tired of as a consultant is I wanted to really stay in an organization and work the program. And I have the opportunity to work the program at Drexel. So what does a day look like? Um, it depends on the moment. Um, <laughs> no day is the same. Uh, I plan my day. And before I even sit in front of my computer and I pick up my phone, my day is already blown because um, you're, I, I am answering, responding to, um, I can get an incident, as you mentioned, actually last Friday, I got an explosive uh, concern um, from, the, uh, from the person reporting his perspective anyway. And they waited until 4.45 on Friday <laughs> to uh, call and give it to me. Um, and you know, when that happens, you know they've held on to it all week um, and thought, oh, it's nice. It's a good time to give it to the compliance officer and let her worry about it all weekend. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, people like to ask compliance officers, and, and I, I said this recently in our newsletter, people like to ask compliance officers what keeps you up at night. And um, I think it's time for us to move beyond that as compliance officers um, and get a good night's sleep because you need to be well rested every single day to, to approach compliance. Uh, my name is Bob Kay. I am the executive director of compliance at a little hospital in southwestern Georgia. I'm in a, in a town called Columbus, Georgia, um, with a hospital called St. Francis. I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I spent, uh, I started my career a little bit differently in that I was, I started out in healthcare as a respiratory therapist. And about 150 years ago, I graduated from Hahnemann Medical College and Hospital. Um, 
I moved on from there. I worked at some hospitals that are now defunct. I worked at St. Agnes Hospital in Philadelphia, no longer there. Uh, moved out to Paoli, worked at Bryn Mawr, um, did a little time at Blankenau. Actually did a lot of time in, as a respiratory therapist, even did home care as a second job. And then uh, I wound up getting too many initials behind my name and I wound up being in compliance. Um, I attended a master's of jurisprudence program at Widener. Um, Drexel didn't exist at that time. In fact, one of my professors at Widener moved on to Drexel, um, Dr. Furrow. I call him Dr. Furrow. He doesn't like to be called doctor. But Professor Furrow, I believe, was one of the founding members at Drexel Law. And um, so here I sit today. Uh, prior to here, I had gone back. Um, I left my respiratory career, went into compliance. I worked under tenant, under a corporate integrity agreement. So I was the first to kind of train for and implement the CIA at tenant. I left Hahnemann after in compliance after about... Um, Oh, close to four years. Prior to that, I was a clinical director of four different departments, moved into compliance, about four years in compliance. I went over to Cooper for about six years. I went down to Baltimore and had two hospitals in the MedStar organization. And now I am. I went back to Hahnemann. Um, as you know, Hahnemann closed. I was present for that, that, uh, that death. And I also oversaw St. Christopher's and I stayed there until that was sold. And since then I moved to Georgia. So I maintain a home in Pennsylvania and uh, I will be flying home this Friday evening. But right now I'm sitting in Columbus, Georgia next to the Chattahoochee River, looking out to Alabama. And uh, here I sit. So we all actually, anyone who is in compliance knows that we come from, if you go to a compliance association meeting or a convention, everyone comes from a different background. And many of us did not purposely go into compliance. It kind of fell into us or we fell into it. And uh, you will find folks um, with my background, you'll find folks with nursing backgrounds, you'll find folks like Kim with legal backgrounds, you'll find, and consulting, um, you'll find folks from medical records, all different backgrounds. And uh, I think we all bring um, different qualities to the job. And one of the things that I would encourage all of the students out there now is that when we're done, um, connect with us, I believe, um, you will have our emails at some point. So I would, I would suggest reach out. So connect with us. Let us be some of your first networking. Um, okay, so I'm going to segue over now to Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey. And I'm going to bring up uh, Jerome and then Tim, uh, your backgrounds and, um, you know, what's a typical day in the life? So, so Jerome Kearns, I am, I'm currently the, uh, the compliance officer at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield for our government programs. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid and our commercial and vendor lines of business. Uh, um, and I'm also the director of regulatory requirements. So uh, I've been with the company for uh, a little over six years now. And uh, um, prior to that, I was a litigator by trade. I was a public defender in, in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, gang and, and homicide and drug related cases. And then prior to that, I was in the Air Force JAG Corps uh, on active duty military for four years, and I've been a reserve uh, JAG officer for the last six years now. Um, I'm, a, I'm a New Jersey guy. I went to Seton Hall Law School for, for uh, my studies for, for my JD and uh, Rutgers for my undergrad. And, um, and, and Paul, I'll throw this out there that, that we're always happy to partner with Drexel. Um, through the years, you guys have given us a ton of, of fantastic externs. Wonderful. Any of the uh, MSJs or, or, or law school undergrad. Uh, students are looking for externships during the semester even though we're virtual right now we're still looking for for people that are looking to get in the field and uh, and we've also hired a couple of your 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 former alumni uh, yes you have compliance departments and so it's been a very successful partnership and i thank you and the dean and and, and your thank college you. um a day in the life so uh you know as, as you can imagine in the last nine months have kind of been a whirlwind with the pandemic uh, unfortunately, it's it's impacted. It's been the elephant in the room, and uh, it's dominated both the political stage and and the healthcare sector and our personal and professional lives. So, a lot of what I've been doing over the past 
eight, eight or nine months has been triaging that for our, our, uh, we have almost 4 million members and uh, making sure they have access to care, affordable care, and, uh, and, and, and making sure that the company stays on the right side of the, the daily guidance that comes out uh, almost on the hour every day from our federal regulatory bodies and our state regulators. And, uh, and just making sure that we are, are uh, putting the, the, the health care of our members first. Um, outside of the pandemic, as a, as a day-to-day compliance uh, officer, um, really, I think, I think that MSJ students and, and law students are, are best positioned to enter the, the, the compliance field. I always say that, that legal in-house interprets the law and advises on it. In compliance, you get to enforce it. Uh, so you have a little more teeth behind your opinions. And uh, you get to have oversight of everything. So, so all of operations, all your business partners, you have oversight. But the nice thing about being a compliance officer is uh, while you, you have oversight of everything, you don't own anything. And so um, you can kind of say yes or no and, uh, and, and really enforce the rules and regulatory requirements for your business partners. And, and there's a constant triage, as, as my colleagues have said. Um, you know, I can't tell you, I wake up to 100 emails every morning. And, uh, and I'm, I'm answering a million before I go to bed at night. But uh, as far as what keeps me up at night, it's not compliance. Thankfully, <laughs> being in-house, uh, I have an 11-month-old son. He, he keeps me up at night. <laughs> but, uh, but, but really, I'll actually flip that. What I ask uh, from my perspective, from a risk perspective, is I ask my, my client base what keeps them up at night. Because that's, that's one of my biggest priorities, figuring out, mm-hmm. bothering them. And how do we proactively address their concerns? I'd, I'd much, much rather them come to me than a regulator come to me and tell me that we're doing something wrong. So, so getting out ahead of that and figuring out how to avoid those landmines before we step in. And, and, and really my biggest job as a compliance officer is recognizing that I'm an officer of the company first. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a compliance officer. My job is to help clicker. Their, clicker. their strategies. And so making sure I have a seat at the table, I think, uh, uh, a lot of the panel members have a ton of experience uh, in this field, and uh, they can probably tell you better than I can, but, but the rumor has it that you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, compliance was kind of the place where uh, you know, lawyers went to die, and it was the, the land of misfit toys. But you've seen uh, over the last 10 years or so a significant investment based on the Enrons of the world, the Madoffs of the world. Uh, the, the, corporate, the corporate world was really investing in compliance and buying in and drinking the Kool-Aid. And so... Um, you know, just staying out ahead of the regulatory guidance and proactively digesting it, disseminating it to my business partners, and then tracking evidence of compliance with, with those rules so that we're protected from an audit perspective. Um, so that's kind of the day in the life of, of me. And uh, I'll kick it to my colleague who has a much cooler job than I, I do. Cooler job? I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely a different job. But I, I'd like to, I kid Jerome, um, I'm kind of where Jerome goes, you know, where, when things go south. My name's uh, Tim Deneen. I'm the director of special investigations uh, for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey. So I deal with the, the fraud, waste, and abuse uh, in the healthcare community. A um, little background on me. Um, I, I hate to say how long I've been at this. Uh, Bob, I was, I was uh, imp- you know, I was jealous of your background. You've been bouncing all over the place. But I've been with Horizon for... Um, you know, close to 25 years, um, kind of two tours of duty. Uh, I was with Horizon before it was Horizon, just Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Um, I worked in, in, in another carrier for a while, and I've also worked uh, what we refer to as on the payer side. I worked for Mount Sinai Medical System in New York City doing internal investigations and what have you for them. That's where I was first exposed to compliance, really from a HIPAA, from a privacy perspective, those types of things. I work with the privacy officer over there. Um, you know, great woman to work with there. And she, you know, she called me up when people were poking around in medical records they shouldn't be poking around in, like uh, say, like Rudy Giuliani or somebody like that. So they don't want they don't want people poking around in those systems and those types of things. Uh, I am not a lawyer, so um, criminal justice major, University of Delaware. So I'm a fighting blue hen. Uh, I got my master's in public administration from Seton Hall University. So you got two pirates here uh, and you know kind of where we go. Uh, and again, I've been at this for a long time, a certified fraud examiner. Um, and, you know, I have some some other degrees and certifications and those ki- types of things having to do with IT and um, information security, privacy and all those types of things. So, 
that's kind of my background. I think first and foremost, I think the, the, the number one thing I'd like to, to express here is collaboration in this world. And I think I got to give Jerome a lot of credit. There's nobody who's a better collaborator. I think back in the days of compliance, it was almost kind of keep those folks away. Um, but I, I really, you know, work with Jerome on a regular basis and I do tell him what I worry about. And I do want to talk to Jerome and his folks before I talk to a regulator so that, you know, CMS auditors like to come in and do their audits and Jerome and his team, you know, just prepare us, you know, as a business unit to be prepared, making sure we're doing the right things, uh, making sure we have all our checks and balances in place, making sure we have a hotline, we're answering it properly, all those types of things that, you know, I, I'm generally laser focused on catching the bad guy, but we have to make sure we're doing the right things uh, as an organization. I have an internal investigations team, um, and I also have, which is the lion's share of my team. I have 43 folks working for me, um, getting yeah. after the fraud. Mostly fraud is kind of what we focus on. Uh, we collaborate with other areas of the company with regard to the waste and abuse, medical necessity, those types of things. Uh, an, a day in the life for me, Kim, I got to say, I stopped making a plan. I have a to-do list, um, <laughs> but I stopped making a plan. I just have no plan each day. Um, I like to kid myself and try to write one out, but it, it never seems to work out. Um, so today, for instance, I just figured I'd throw this out to all of you. Uh, we met with, my team met with our behavioral health folks uh, who are focused on, you know, those services and making sure our members get what they need and what have you. And we have a real vexing problem that we're dealing with, ongoing investigations, challenges, and we identified a policy deficiency um, and we, we got together with them to work on how, how can we get a better policy in place to help us address these issues. So that was kind of the start of my day. Um, you know, during the middle of the day or so, one of my managers called me up and we got a real problematic provider uh, and their counsel um, not willing to work with us. They've admitted to committing fraud. The provider admitted to billing us for things that, that he didn't do. Uh, but doesn't want to deal with us, doesn't want to you know, pay us back. So there's levers we can pull, but there's risks associated with those levers. So we had a good conversation. And Jerome, you'll get, the, you'll get his name soon, you know, probably uh, tomorrow, um, just so you have a heads up, because um, he may be calling or he'll call the regulators. So, and that's what I talk about in terms of collaboration. My day is about making sure the right people know um, that we're upsetting somebody. We tend to upset people. It's just kind of what we do. Um, and then I ended the day, I got an offer to do, you know, from one of the prof professional organizations I'm part of to kind of do a survey. They want to do a deep dive on something. Uh, and of course they want to give me a gift card. So my first email was to my compliance officer, uh, Wendy Jerome, who handles kind of the internal compliance things. And I said, is this okay? She said, no, it's not. I said, great, not doing it. So, um, you know, that's the collaboration. Those are the types of things, but that's a day in a life for me. Um, and I'm, I'm really, uh, Paul, I really appreciate the invite again. I had a good time when we came down to Drexel, great students, great interaction. Um, and I hope I give you all kind of another lane, another thing to think about in this world. So. And thank you, Tim and, and Jerome. Uh, which leads us right into, Tim, as you had mentioned HIPAA. Well, we are not going to forget privacy because HIPAA privacy is huge. It's, it's going to always be there. It's growing. And that's why I'm bringing Jason in also to discuss uh, HIPAA privacy. So uh, Jason, take it away. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so my name is Jason Cannell. I'm currently the Director of Privacy and Security uh, for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I've been in compliance for about the last eight years now. Um, I graduated from uh, Seton Hall University School of Law um, in 2011, um, and I went right in, into compliance. Um, I started as a uh, compliance analyst um, at uh, Coventry Healthcare. Uh, they were uh, a health insurer, um, and I slowly worked my way up. Um, I actually took over for Paul um, as the executive director of uh, privacy and compliance at Drexel University. Um, and I got to briefly work for Kim. He was a great boss, by the way. Um, and from there, uh, I moved on, on to Kaiser. Um, so, you know, uh, building on what the other panelists said, um, and working on working in compliance, um, there really is no typical day. Um, it will constantly vary. And that's one of the best things about working in compliance, right? You'll never be bored. Um, you know, one day you might be working on you know, a large-scale privacy incident, 
Um, another day you might get um, a complaint from the Office of Civil Rights. Um, you know, that might require weeks of, you know, building documentation um, and reporting out. Um, you know, another day you might be, um, you know, doing some privacy training, uh, developing policies and procedures, um, you know, possibly participating in compliance committees, um, you know, and performing risk assessments. Um, and, you know, performing risk assessments is kind of like where I'd like to focus, um, like the other panelists were saying, compliance, you want to be proactive when it comes to following the rules. And, you know, in my case, that would be HIPAA um, and some other state uh, privacy rules. So, you know, we work closely um, and collaborate, um, you know, with our various department heads, um, you know, to find out where the areas of concern lie. So, you know, they'll tell us where, where the privacy issues lie and, you know, we'll use that to build a work plan, right? So we can be proactive and hopefully um, prevent, you know, privacy issues from, from popping up um, ahead of time. Um, again, an another key area, uh, like I said, is uh, um, I oversee um, the investigation of, of privacy incidents. And that's one area um, that I really enjoy, the actual investigation process. Um, you know, large-scale privacy incidents typically involve uh, putting together um, an incident management team. Um, and again, that involves a lot of collaboration. Uh, you'll be working with communications, um, possibly HR, legal, um, your information security team, um, and you know, going through the investigation process, um, you know, talking about um, different regulatory reporting requirements that, that might um, result from a privacy breach. Um, and the various types of communications that, that might need to be provided to members um, as well as, as media. Um, so again, um, you know, I think working in compliance, um, you know, it's a great career path. Uh, like I said, you'll, you'll never be bored. Um, you know, if, and if this is um, kind of a career path that, you know, you, um, you, know, you do decide you wanna take, you know, always feel free to, to reach out to me um, more than happy to provide guidance um, wherever I can. Thanks, Jason. I, I really appreciate that all of you have been offering of yourself and time uh, to mentor students about this. Um, so number two, um, what skills, so we're now we're talking about skills, uh, what skills are particularly important to your success in this area? And I know all of you are coming with different skill sets. So for you in particular, what, what, what skills stand out? Um, um, one of the things that, that Jerome talked about was a, a great term that I think wraps us, wraps up how we should interact. Jerome used the term business partner and we are business partners. And one of the things that different, differentiates us from our less successful co um, cohorts, colleagues, are those that go in as the bad cop or the, in, the internal the internal affairs cop. We are business partners. We should be yeah. involved in decision making as it's being first considered. And it, it shouldn't be, we should not be coming in in a retroactive kind of view. Um, we need to be partners in that decision making. And um, that's gonna, that, that totally depends on relationships. So one of your, what I think Everyone can have the skills of knowing what rules and regulations are out there. That, that you know, you can teach a lot of people what the rules and regs are. What what you need to do is be able to communicate that so that you're able to um, convince people that are doubting. And that and that comes up with relationships. How do you build a relationship? So um, I think a, a few people have echoed relationships. And Jerome, you spoke about business partners. That's exactly what we are. Um, the skill set that you bring, you can bring the greatest skills on the planet, but if you don't have, a, you, if you can't build a relationship, you will fail. I think the ability to communicate you mentioned, Bob, is, is so important. I like to, I like to, um, it, you know, when you're, especially when you're starting out in, in this career and you've, you've learned, you've gone through years of school and you're proving yourself um, and you've learned all these different regulations and you know the regulations and you're like an expert I, when, when I, I've been around a while. So I was, I, I first learned HIPAA, the HIPAA privacy rule when it was introduced at a CLE. <laughs> um, and I thought, who's going to learn that? Like, what? 
and I ended up reading it three times. And then I was an expert because who else read it, right? So, um, and then of course, two years later, it changed and that's a whole bit different thing. But I knew all this stuff. And so when I went out talking to people, I wanted to impress them with what I knew. Well, no one else is doing that, right? No one else is reading it that way. They don't care about it like that. What they need is the knowledge is to be able to apply what I need and, and what I have and be able to use it every day. So once you know all of this, the, the communication is so important in being able to talk to people normally uh, in such a way that they can use the information you have to do their jobs and to be effective. Um, helping people to formalize what they do every day. One of the things, just like we're doing right now, um, people love to talk about what they do. They love to talk about what they know. They love to talk about their jobs. And so when you go in, that's, that's one of the things, and I, I think Tim, you'll agree with me. When, you, when you're doing an investigation, let people talk about themselves. Let oh, them talk yeah. about what they do. <laughs> And it's when they stop talking about themselves, that's the information you really need, right? Right, um, right, right. Um, but but I, I think that, you know, to, to kind of um, piggyback on what Bob j uh, just said, it's building relationships and being able to talk to people normally and not talk to them as, it, you know, the bad cop perspective, which is what it was when I started in compliance. But it's a collaborator. It's, it is a person, you are there, not only as a business partner, but support. I'm there to help them su to help support some decision making and to give more guidance because you don't know HIPAA or FERPA or any of the Medicare stuff because nobody knows that either, including the Medicare uh, folks. But that's that, again, that's a whole different issue. Um, nobody knows it like we do. And so help them to to kind of be able to navigate it. I think that's really important. And just, you know, be normal and 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 talk to people and help them through because typically, when we throw show, when we show up, it's not a great situation. That's the way it's been traditionally, and so we're, but we're moving this profession where we are, you know, more collaborative, more business partner, more there at the beginning, and 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 working on initiatives as as opposed to problems. Thank you, Cameron. I think what you mentioned was that communication being the key. Uh, and Bill, uh, Bob, you're talking about business partners, both of those really key points. I, but Tracy, I'm going to call on you not to do the Socratic method, but I'm just going to call on you because you're a recent grad. I just thought I would ask you quickly because we we want to make sure we get everybody in and questions in. But I thought real quickly, uh, Tracy, just having recently graduated, what, what do you think? Skill set? Again, I think, I think what Drexel equipped me to do is think differently and, and think critically. And that's really key to to compliance, right? Like we have to, um, as I said earlier, I'm with an organization that didn't have a robust compliance program. So we're building it and, and um, learning along the way. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, anybody else, Jerome, Tim, Jason? Yeah, you know, Paul, it's, it's Jerome. I'm happy to jump in and just piggyback off of what my colleagues have said. I, I think, um, you know, there are two main skills I think that I, I look for in, in candidates and that I look for in my team is, is one, as Bob kind of touched on, you have to establish that trust with your business partners, right? And, and the only way you do that is uh, get out from behind your desk. And I know we live, we're all working from home now, so there's challenges there and we live in a digital age. Uh, and so, so a lot of people, you know, don't have that skill set where they, they, they understand the importance of going down and sitting down at someone's desk or picking up the phone rather than sending an email and establishing that personal connection where, where you establish the trust, where your clients now come to you uh, proactively with these issues. And, and once you've established that, that, that bridge and that, that border um, and you know the business and you know the key players, the second skill is really being able to drill down on the issue. And, and understand what happened, um, you know, has the bleeding stopped? Uh, how do we stop it if it hasn't, you know, stopped bleeding? Who was impacted? Uh, how, do we, how do we help our members if they were impacted? How do we triage it? How do we correct it? Um, and then, you know, obviously, how do we report it to our regulatory bodies? How do we spin it, right? That, that, that's where our legal <laughs> skill might come in. And how do we learn from it and, and make sure it doesn't happen again and, and establish best practices and get stronger from it? 
And so I think uh, as compliance officers and compliance members, uh, you really need to understand you know, first and foremost, establish that trust with the business because they're the subject matter experts, you are not, right? Your job is to enforce the regulatory requirements and advise your business partners, but they're the ones that know how to build the engine and build the car and drive the car. So, so you have to make sure that they come to you with the issues and then you have to be able to drill down on those issues because those people aren't as articulate as you are, right? They don't understand the ramifications like you do. And so you have to kind of cross-examine them and, and figure out what went wrong and what needs to go right. So that, I mean, those are, those are really important skills, I think, as a compliance officer or in-house lawyer. Um, you know, being an effective business partner um, is, is an important skill. Um, you know, when, when one of your partners comes to you with a new initiative and they wanna know if it's compliant, you might have to say no, but that shouldn't be your final answer. Um, you know, you wanna give them other avenues and alternatives and, and let them know that you're there to work with them not against them. Um, and that's, you know, that's how at least one way that you'd be able to build, you know, effective relationships, um, you know, across the organization. I have two perspectives on this. I'm, I'm sort of a consumer of compliance, right? So when I have a question, I go to Jerome or I go to somebody on his team. Um, but I, I would also say, and this just comes from, you know, I come from a family of uh, four boys, three of which are salespeople. One is me right? Yeah. And it's a sales, it's a sales pitch. Like why is, why is compliance important? And what am I here for? I'm here to keep you ahead of the curve here. Um, and it's, it's just folks realizing the value of compliance and the value of partnering. And a couple panelists have said this, it's, you want to be in the room, you know, you want to be in the first meeting talking about that topic. You want to be in the room early. Um, and I think Jason, you understand this from an IT security space, call us early when you're developing an application. Same thing applies in the compliance world. When you're developing a process, when you're looking at something you wanna do, maybe change your policies, procedures from an SIU perspective, make sure you're compliant with what you're doing. Uh, make sure you're not doing things that are, you know, frankly against the law. You know, there's all kinds of, you know, things that we, guardrails that, that are in place. And I'm not the expert, I rely on my compliance folks, you know, to guide me in that way. So, and that takes a little time. I think Jerome will tell you that takes a little time um, but I can relate like from an SIU perspective, I do internal investigations. Nobody wants to talk to me when I, you know, when I'm coming, obviously it's a big problem. Nobody wants to talk to me. So I get that perspective. And also, um, again, echoing everybody's comments, but it's, you know, and again, it's, it's that sales pitch, so to speak. And a lot of areas have to do that. Thank you, Tim. So that are all excellent answers about skill set. What are the resources out there and connections do you suggest people turn to? And secondly, you know, what networking career organizations, you know, have you been engaged? So, but I, I would suggest anybody who's interested in um, compliance in a particular industry should go see if they can shadow somebody in that industry. Um, when I was at MedStar, when I was in Baltimore, I got to oversee some of my new, newer colleagues in other hospitals. One of them was a CPA who really had no experience in compliance before. My suggestion to him, if he was going to oversee a hospital, I wanted him to spend a day with somebody doing care. I wanted him to spend a day with um, a nurse or a respiratory therapist or both. Because if you don't know how a business operates, you, don't, you can't help with the guide rails. So I think that's important. And, and um, and perhaps my, uh, my colleagues, I, I know nothing about the payer side of things. So I would assume that um, you guys might, other than COVID, you might welcome somebody coming in and kind of researching your industry. But um, yeah, and, and I, you know, the associations are perfect ways to go as well. Attend as many in person as you can, if, if you can, if COVID allows that. But go into the industry, go shadow somebody if COVID allows that. I agree, Bob. Um, when I was at, at Seton Hall, um, this is one of the things you, know, you all might want to do is reach out to your career development department. Um, they might be able to hook you up with alumni that has compliance experience, right? And maybe you'll be able to shadow them, you know, possibly even uh, you know, have a, you know, some career opportunities there. So something to think about. That's Audrey great. also brought up that we, you know, the virtual career office is also a wonderful place to go. So we have developed this for the students to really go there. So we really do have, you know, we have job listings there. We have associations posted. We have um, modules there all to help 
these students do that. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. I would also um, add, uh, um, I know Drexel usually has a table at the Health Law Institute of the yeah. Pennsylvania Bar Institute. Um, you'll get, I don't know if you can apply credits when you're still in school. Um, I think you can, but that's also great. They have really good um, sessions. As I mentioned, I learned about HIPAA at a CLE, so never take your CLEs for, for granted. If I can just quickly make the point, um, and I, I mean this in the most genuine and sincere way because this is something that I struggled with as a, as a new graduate. Uh, I would say to the, the people that are attending, get over yourself. Yeah. Right? Make, make that awkward outreach because it's the way you're gonna get your job. And, and, and it's uncomfortable and it's hard to do, especially when we're in a pandemic and, and you're, you're doing it virtually and you're not grabbing a cup of coffee or a lunch or a beer. Uh, the last three jobs I got, it wasn't because my resume standed out, it's because someone handed my resume to the right person making the right decision and they got my foot in the door and I started interview, interviewing and selling myself. But a lot of times when you're reviewing resumes, and it, it's, it's hard to stand out. And there's a ton of talent out there in the market. Is, you know, there's a lot of people looking for jobs. And so you have to be able to get over yourself and reach out to your friends, to your family, to your past coworkers, to your professors, to people that you're meeting on the panel. I think every one of my colleagues on this panel said tonight, feel free to reach out to me. And, and we mean it because we've all been there. It's tough. Uh, I graduated from Seton Hall Law School, Jason. Glad to have him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in, in, 2008, <laughs> yeah, in, two, in 2008, and it was probably the worst market imaginable for lawyers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so, so it's tough. It's a hustle, but, but you need to be able to overcome that awkward outreach and, and establish those connections and, and have some sort of virtual cup of coffee or a virtual connection or reach out to us on LinkedIn and, and then just say, hey, I'd love to follow up. Your, your initial outreach shouldn't be, hey, can you get me a job, right? But, but tell me about your career and how you got to where you can be. And this is what I've been doing. Is it, you know, what would you recommend? And, uh, and certainly you can attend the CLEs and the conferences. Those are all great networking opportunities and great educational opportunities. Um, but there's no compromise for personal connection. Uh, you know, people that can go to bat for you. And the only way you do that is to, is to make that, that initial step. Um, tips for your younger self. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your younger self when considering a career in healthcare compliance? And with that, I'll just say, you know, rapid fire, put it out there. What would you tell yourself? Because we're all at that age where we're like, boy, if I could go back, I have it now with my daughter. If I had to go back, it'd be exactly what you just said, Jerome. I'd say, put yourself out there, uh, be embarrassed go into someone's office or call them on the phone, they're more often than not wanting to help, willing to help. We all, you know, we all wanna be in that situation. That's why we're here tonight. Um, I don't think any experience is necessarily bad experience. Um, sometimes, you know, I've, I, I've had several jobs in my career and I've been able to learn something from each one of them that I use now in my career. Um, I was a claims adjuster coming out of college and that taught me how to do exactly what you said, Jerome. I am able to talk to people because I had to do interviews as a claims adjuster. And so who would have known that from a claims adjuster, I'd be a compliance officer. Um, but the experience helped me to, to get to where I am today. So no, no job experience. I don't care what you've done. You've learned some skill. Use the skills. There's no perfect path, right? Just get your foot in the door. Uh, figure out your path. You can imagine coming out for the criminal justice degree. It was all federal law enforcement. That's what I was interested in. That's what I thought my path was. And it was uh, really challenging at the time to get a job there. So I took a job as a claims examiner at Blue Cross. Um, and secondly, always listen to your dad, especially when he hands you a little article about this special <laughs> investigations team at uh, Blue Cross. And hey, maybe you want to do this. So you may think you know what all the options are, uh, in this world, but I had no idea there was fraud investigations unit at healthcare companies. Never even came up in my criminal justice program. So uh, I agree with Kim, there's no perfect path. And all my experiences throughout the years have, have certainly made me much better at what I do now, much more different perspectives um, and, and what have you, so. I would just say, um, you know, if an opportunity presents itself, even if you think you might not have all the qualifications right off the bat, um, you should take it, right? Um, because you can always develop the skills, um, you, know, to, you know, to do what needs to be done um, for whatever that, any particular opportunity, uh, but the opportunity might not come around again. So, you know, if the opportunity mm -hmm. arises um, and you think it's something that you might be interested in, um, you know, don't, don't pass it up.
if you're a good boss, you're going to recognize talent, no matter how polished it may present to you on that first go round. Um, but we, we've all been in that situation. And so mentor, develop, um, help, them, help them come along. Don't get discouraged, right? Yeah. It, so, so as you're putting yourself out there, you're gonna get rejected a whole lot. I remember when I first graduated and was looking for a job, I probably sent out somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 different applications to get a clerkship. And finally, I started getting some interviews. And, but I, you know, every, almost every job or, or, or career stepping stone that I took, I probably have a stack of, of rejection letters that, that are almost as tall as myself, right? So, so don't get discouraged. You, you know, as cliche as it sounds, cast a wide net, be open to any opportunity and cast an even, even wider net when you're looking to network. Uh, you know, you, you never know who's gonna lead to your next job, whether that's a friend of your parents um, or, or an old professor or uh, just someone that you worked with at Starbucks or something like that, right? Things, things change in the world and, and people know people. And the only way you're gonna be able to take advantage of that is putting yourself out there and not getting discouraged by, by the rejections that you're gonna, you know, every, every, for every 10 rejections, if you get one bite, there you go. That's all you need. Um, so, so stay focused on that and, and kind of set a plan on where you want to be and what you want to do and, and don't give up hope and, and keep, keep driving towards that and reach out to the people uh, that you know, and even the ones you don't know, because like Paul said, people want to help. People want to feel valued and people have been in your situation. So uh, by all means, take advantage of that. Uh, they ask, I'm a late bloomer. Um, and this person will be turning a certain age uh, and they want to know, is age a factor in becoming a compliance employee? So hitting 50 or hitting a certain age, is it, is it too late for them? And I, I would be the first to say absolutely not. Um, but I'll leave it up to you guys. What do you think? I think, no, no, I don't. Um, I think more than, than age is your willingness. That, that, that's another thing I think it's really important in compliance is your willingness to learn to yep. dig into information that you that may be new to you, because I think all of us would agree every day we're learning something new. Um, you know, I think Jason said it. Hi, Jason. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you're you're constantly learning, and as long as you're, and I think as long as we're still breathing, we st we're still learning. So age doesn't I think it's a negative at all, not at all. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, yeah, use use some of the skill set that you you've already developed, right? Um, you'll almost certainly be able to apply that to, you know, any, any compliance role out there. It's not, um, it's not rocket science, right? Um, so if it, if it's just something that you, you want to get into, um, you know, like, uh, Jerome said, be persistent. Um, and I'm sure yeah, you'll find your place. Um, I'll also mention, um, the VCO, I know Laurel Vaughn still, but I, I, the, the VCO that is out there, they put this together. It's an amazing resource for everybody. Um, and I think uh, you could learn a lot from being a part of that. It was, it's really what was the basis of tonight's um, panel to, to guide you to that place and also to kind of meet our panelists who, who really, as you've learned tonight, are, are all walks of life. Um, and the variety to me is the spice of compliance, I think. And that's what I saw Kim mention, Tracy, Bob, Jerome, Tim, Jason, you've all mentioned the same thing that I'm saying, it's wonderful to have a differing background, Bob, differing background to bring to the table skill sets. Um, and I think compliance welcomes it. I think it benefits from it. I did wanna say first, thank you so much. This was a fabulous panel. Everything that you said so resonated with me having run compliance, even though I haven't done that in the healthcare field. And it just is so informative for our students. So thank you for that. Um, really appreciate it. And we will post this in the VCO so that additional people can also view it. I wanted to point out or touch on something that Kim said about transferable skills. This is one of the specific things that we actually work on with students in the VCO. We've had so many students say, I don't think I can apply for that compliance job. I haven't done exactly that. And really getting them to understand that they've done something in their life that is similar, right? It's the same verb, it's the same competency. They've just applied it to something else. Um, but so many people from different backgrounds come into this field and find wonderful career paths. So I just wanted to say, don't be afraid to actually engage, apply, you know, um, go through and get a certificate or degree. There's a lot out there. As Paul said, the area is growing so much. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that. So thank you all again.
Thank and I'll just Lauren. add, I appreciated the panel very much as well. And I think some of the comments about grit and, you know, um, just putting yourself out there, um, that's, you know, we give the opportunity to do a little bit of that in the VCO in terms of practice. You know, we can practice elevator speeches, um, you know, talk about networking tech, you know, techniques and that kind of thing. So, um, and I do very much appreciate everybody being willing to give up their time to share their experience because it really is valuable. Thank you, Laura. Um, so thank you to the panelists. I am just really honored that you agreed to speak here tonight. More importantly, I think the students really um, benefit from this. And I appreciate that all of you have offered to speak to them individually. I know, I know all of you and all of you have done that in the past. It's one of the reasons that I asked you to speak tonight because I know that that's who you are. Um, and I know that's Laurel and Laura are the same way. So all of us here are here for you. Um, I think this was an amazing event. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. So um, thank you all for the time you spent. We're at eight o'clock, um, wonderful event. And I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. And I hope the students will uh, also reach out as well. <laughs>